God had been talking to me about. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm in one of those weeks where my voice is really ugly, so uh, please pray for me about that. Um, but I, I shared with you um, that I wanted to encourage you to take a moment as the weeks were approaching um, and, uh, and look at the way uh, the Lord had been active in your life and ordering your steps. Now, let me just uh, start with a little bit of Scripture, even though um, many of us know these Scriptures, but I want to just lay some foundation for uh, the specifics that you are seeing in your life or that I'm going to uh, talk about uh, in a few minutes. So, <clears throat> Psalm 37, verse 23, says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Would you say ordered by the Lord? And it says, and he, and it's capitalized there. So it says he, that means God, delights in his way. And it's interesting because depending upon what's capitalized could make a difference in the last part of that verse. But what it's really saying is that God delights in that man's way when that man walks in the way or the steps that are ordered by the Lord. Amen? So we say that. We say that our steps are ordered by the Lord. And if so, and it is true, then how is it that the Lord orders his steps? How is it that the Lord wants to order our steps? Now, there's, there's lots of ways that can show up in our life, but the way that the Lord uh, primarily wants to order our steps is actually through his word. Now, that can be, that can be the Logos word, that can be all 66 books of the canon of scripture, um, but, but more specifically, it has to do with what uh, is his rhema word for us. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the word rhema, it just simply means kind of a specific word. It means like not just a general word, but, but, um, but a word for you. So let me give you an example of that um, in Scripture. Uh, this is how I believe God works. Now, you're familiar with the story where Jesus had just started to come on the scene in his physical ministry in the earth, um, and he came to John to be baptized, and John said, no, I, you know, I should be baptized by you. Don't, you know, don't baptize, don't let me baptize you. And Jesus said, no, suffer it to be so for the sake of righteousness. And so, you know, John baptized Jesus. And Jesus comes up out of the water, and it says that the heavens opened, and uh, the Spirit descended, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And we hear then a voice from heaven speak, which was the voice of the Father. It also happened, by the way, uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration, when God spoke uh, audibly enough for others to hear his voice. But in this particular case, the father says, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Hear him or listen to him. And so what does that have to do with what I'm talking about? Well, I believe that the Holy Spirit always, will you say always? Always, always needs the word of God to light upon. The Holy Spirit bears witness to the truth. The Holy Spirit bears witness to Jesus. Of course, we know the scripture said that Jesus is the word made flesh. He's the word incarnate. In the beginning was, according to John, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God and we beheld his glory. The only uh, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, <clears throat> So the Holy Spirit 
And, and Jesus also said, I don't do anything on my own. I only do what the, I see the Father doing, or what, in other words, I didn't come to do my own will. I only do what the Father directs me to do. And then he said, and so I don't speak things on my own. In other words, he, he's saying what the Father tells him to say. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit later on. And he says, the Holy Spirit won't speak on his own. The Holy Spirit, I'm paraphrasing, Holy Spirit won't act on his own, but I give to, or what I get, I give to the Holy Spirit, and then he comes and reveals it. So we know the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, amen? So the point is that the Holy Spirit cannot bear witness to anything that is not the truth of God or the Word of God. Now, we know that the primary Word of God is the Logos Word of God that, that was recorded in these 66 books. But the Scripture also says that not everything that Jesus said or did was able to be recorded in those books. It would take volumes to have captured all that. So what I'm saying is that there might be a time when God is speaking and saying something to you or I directly that could come uh, in a dream, that could come from a a prophetic word delivered to you by uh, someone else. And as long as those are accurate, then, then that is the word of God. Are you with me? It's not the Logos Word of God, but it's, the, it's a communication from God himself. And that is something the Holy Spirit can bear witness to, or in other words, give his agreement to. And so in this particular case, uh, in my example with Jesus' baptism, Jesus is the Word made flesh. The Holy, when Jesus submits to righteousness, the Holy Spirit comes down out of heaven like a dove and lights upon the word, bearing witness to the word, and then rhema comes forth, or in other words, revelation, specific revelation comes forth, and we hear the voice of God saying, giving revelation to exactly what's going on. This is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased to hear him. And so the process is word, witness, revelation. Are you with me? For example, Logos word, the Holy Spirit lighting upon it, and then illumination or a rhema word comes forward for you and I. Rhema meaning that there are times uh, in your life or my life, I'm sure, where you know you might have been reading some particular passage in the Bible, some particular book, some scripture, and you've read it before. But this time, something's different in the reading because a revelation, light, illumination, specific direction or wisdom for you is occurring in that moment with the reading of that scripture, even though you've read that scripture who knows how many times before. Well, why is that? Is it because you're smarter now? than the last time you read it? No, I don't believe that's it. I believe it's because God is, uh, the God the Father is trying to order your steps or order my steps, not, with, not just with his general word, and I'm not trying to diminish in any way the importance of the whole canon of Scripture or the word of God, but I am trying to emphasize that within that whole canon of Scripture, even though we could and always should apply it to our lives, there are times the Holy Spirit says, <clears throat> there's wisdom for you in this Scripture, and he's trying to, to get your attention so that you don't miss it. Specific direction, specific counsel, um, or light, understanding, illumination is now coming. And so the Father is ordering your steps by saying to the son, this is the course or the path I have for so-and-so, son, speak the word, Holy Spirit, light upon that word so revelation comes forth 
so I can get them either changed on the inside, which God's always trying to do, um, but, but getting uh, us able to then walk in or walk out that specific word. Are you with me? And so the point is that I believe that the process of God to order our steps is not just with general word, but with word that is specifically for you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Because the course of your life is a little different than the course of my life. The experiences of your life are a little different than the experiences of your life. That's one of the reasons why it's, it's so good uh, for us to converse with one another and talk about our life and uh, how we've seen God uh, show up in our life. Because uh, you may give me an example where the Lord directed your path through a certain scripture or a certain revelation or a certain light and 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 you can make that application and you make it clear to me and I'd never seen that in that scripture before. That scripture had never spoken to me that way even though I knew the scripture, that particular scripture, but because God ordered your steps in it, it was light to your path. You're, you're with me. So then that becomes an opportunity for me then to receive that light and that life from you and now God can expand my understanding uh, in that particular area. Amen? And so um, Matthew 4.4, 4, we know the scripture. Jesus is speaking and he says, it is written that man should not live or shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds or proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so the principle there is that when God speaks, it's a proceeding word, not just a word. It's a proceeding word. Proceed is a journey word. Proceed is a destination word. It's a walk word. Amen? It's a path word. And so in other words, when God speaks a word, that word is for us to use to help us proceed, to help us move, to help us walk, to help us grow, to help us um, progress. Amen? In Psalm 199, uh, 105 says, and I just quoted it, you know, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto thy path. And so that means that the word of God lamps my feet and lights my path. There's another scripture that says that in his light, we see light. So in other words, God begins to reveal light and then it's at my feet or for my, in other words, for my walking, it's illumination for my walking. I take a step in the light, in that word, and then in his light, I get more light. Amen? Uh, oh, I believe one of the reasons that we don't progress like we should is that there's a, God gives us initial light. God gives revelation. God reveals truth. God might even show us a way that we're supposed to be going. But if we don't take the step of faith to, to step out on that word and walk in that word, we don't get the rest of the light or the revelation that comes with that light. Because in his light, there's more light, amen? There's no new truth, but there is further revelation. There is additional understanding, amen? Do you agree? Amen. It also says in Psalm uh, 119 that it says, I've hidden your word in your heart that I might not sin against you. And so remember that the word sin means missing the mark. Amen? I don't know if you n knew this, but uh, sin is actually an archery term. So, for example, if you have an archer with an, a bow and arrow, and he takes the bow and the arrow, 
and he aims at the very center of the target, if the arrow hits the very center of the target, what's that called? A bullseye. Do you know that if that arrow hits anything but the bullseye, do you know in archery, do you know what that's called? Sin, missing the mark. It means you missed the bullseye. So it would be bullseye, bullseye, sin, sin. It means missing the mark. And so this scripture says, I've hidden your word in my heart so I don't miss the mark, so I don't miss the bullseye, so I don't miss the target. Now, if you think about this for a minute, if God really is ordering your steps with specific word, will you say specific word? With rhema word, with word that is for you. If God really is ordering your steps with specific word, it means that there's already a target. Hear me now. There's already a mark. There's already a bullseye. You already have a destiny. Doesn't the scripture say, I know the plans I have for you. Finish it for me, Jess. I know the plans I have for you. Plans what? Plans for good or plans to prosper you and not for evil. What's that mean? That means that God already has designed for you where you're supposed to end up. Praise the Lord. Doesn't the scripture say that he is the author and the what? And the what? Thank you, Lord. And the finisher of our faith. In other words, he's already written the book of your life. And he's finished the book of your life. See, but we don't think that way, do we? See, because we're in the midst of trying to figure this thing out. We live our life as though the pages are empty. Come on. Come on, y'all. Hear me now. We live our lives as though the pages are empty and they're only being filled in as we go each day. Which means, if you take that to its conclusion, that our life is random. And our life could end up any old way. Do you believe that about your life? I do not. Do you believe that about your God? I do not. Too much scripture says that's not true. Amen? Do you know that the word of God says that God finishes a thing? You said it, didn't you? Where? From the beginning. Right? Now, I know in some uh, times past I've shared this with you, but I want to just briefly touch it for the moment. God is not bound by time. Amen? But we live in time. Right? And that means that God is able to be present in our past, in our present, and in our future at the same time. Now, that kind of blows our mind. That's hard for us to get our mind around. I understand that. But the point is, We are walking out the course of our life in time, but God's not bound by time. And so God knows because God can be and is at the end of our days. Amen? The end of our natural days, he is there. So he knows the course of our life in its completion. He knows every day before we live it. He knows every thought before we think it. He knows every word before we speak it. Isn't that what Psalm, uh, Psalm um, 139 says? You knit me together in my mother's womb. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Lo, before a word is on my mouth, altogether you know it. The, 
the amazing thing is he still lets us do it. There are some things I wish he wouldn't let me do. Amen? Some things I wish he wouldn't have let me do. <clears throat> but he gives us free will and thereby um, everything that we do, we have the opportunity, amen, to do in free will. God didn't want robots. He could have made robots. But that, see, that's not love because a robot can never love you. You can, you can take a computer and you could program it with all your computer knowledge and have it come out to do, if you were that good, do exactly what you wanted to do, but it'd have no free will. You could even make that computer say to you, I love you, but it doesn't love you because it didn't choose to love you. It didn't have the opportunity to not love you or to reject you. It didn't have the opportunity to learn and figure all those things out. So God gives us free will to do all that, amen? He just knows what we're going to choose in our free will, which is why so many people, by the way, struggle theologically with understanding predestination and free will because there's kind of two theological camps. One is the predestination camp. The other is the free will camp. And the predestination camp says it really doesn't matter what you do because you're predestined to whatever. And the free will said, oh, no, it's what you choose to do. And the reality is it's both. See, if God knows at the end all the decisions you're going to make, if God knows that you will in your free will choose to come into relationship with him and accept Christ as Savior, then he can predestinate you to that because you already chose it. So the Bible can say you were destined to that. It doesn't mean that God made you do it and then rejected some. Are you right? Right? doesn't mean God saved some and didn't save others. It means that God knew at the end some would and some wouldn't. He knew exactly who would and who wouldn't. I got a sidetracked a little bit. <clears throat> and so my point is that, that God has planned our life. God created us for a specific purpose. Amen? Say specific purpose. Say specific. There's a reason you're here. There's a reason I'm here. No, hold up your thumb. Does my thumb look like your thumb? The swirl marks on your thumb, are they different than my thumb? You think anybody else in the whole universe has that pattern on their thumb that you have? Nobody does. It's because God made you unique. There might be some people who have, who have thumbprints that look similar, but not exactly the same. Because God made you specifically to be you and has a specific plan for your life to fill out. You aren't supposed to be me. I'm not supposed to be you. You're not supposed to be Mike. Nike won't you believe that. Be like Mike. Be ourselves. We can learn things from each other, but we got to figure out who our is, that who, who we are. That's part of our identity. That's part of, part of discovering identity. Amen? And understanding purpose. And then pursuing destiny. But again, I want to say to you that, that just because you're a planner, as empty pages all following what you're writing out now, your life doesn't.
David even asked the Lord, he said, teach me to number my days. The scripture said, even, even in Psalm uh, 139 that I quoted a minute ago, it says, in your book are written all the number of my days is what it says. Amen? So here's my point. If that's true, and I believe it is, that God knows the course of our life and God knows the destination of our life, if God has a bullseye for you, one of those bullseyes, by the way, is to be conformed into the image of Christ, to make our, God make us Christ-like. Amen? That's an inside thing. But then there's an expression of Christ. In other words, what's my impact supposed to be in my relationships with each other? How do I impact your life? In other words, what do I do? What do I do in the earth? Some people call that a career. Amen? If our, if our worldly or our earthly career is the same as our purpose, how come so many people, when they get to retirement age, say, now I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do? Because they weren't doing what they always wanted to do. They spent their life, you with me, in the matrix. <laughs> plugged into the system. <clears throat> but so God has this bullseye for us and, and he knows uh, the destination of our conformity to Christ. He knows how he's authoring us, amen. He knows what the finished product is going to be and he knows what you're supposed to do with your life. Will you say that? He knows, he knows. What, I'm what I'm supposed to do with my life. With my, life. My, challenge my challenge is to see, is to see what, he's what he's already finished. And see, there's even a little bit of warfare that goes on right there in what I said because we still think that what I'm seeing and what I'm doing is I'm writing the pages. Now, in some way you are because you have free will, right? But since God knows the free will, those mistakes that you make, those, but thank you, those mistakes that I have made, those things you wish you would never have done, did not catch God by surprise. I'm not saying he agreed with them. But he saw them coming. And doesn't the word of God say that all things work together for the good of who? Those who, hang on, one more thing, one thing first. Those who love God and are called, the, it actually says the called, according to what? According to purpose. So in other words, we have to love God and that, that causes or allows him to start to do some things with the things. Those things that have been done to you or against you that were not good, it allows God to start to take those things that were not good and cause them to work for your good. Oh, you hear me? Why? Because he's got you going somewhere. And he won't allow those things to keep you from getting there. So thank you, thank you, Jesus. Now, we know that some of those things are big things and some of those things are not so big things. 
Some of those big things were out of our control and somebody else did. Some of those big things were things we did. Amen? But the word of God is still true. He can take those things and begin to change their effect on our life if we continue to stay, make sure that we love him. We got to stay in relationship with him and right? God, love's got to stay hot and we got to stay per, pursuing him and right? We got to stay, got to love him and understand that there's a call and a purpose on our life because what God's trying to do is take those things and cause them to work together so that you can still accomplish your purpose. Hear me now. Not just so you'll be okay. I don't know if you all remember, but it was a couple of years ago we were in our old uh, location and the Lord had been ministering to us for really quite some time, uh, washing us with his word and bringing, uh, walking us on a course of healing because of some of the difficulty as a body that we faced, some of the attack and the injury that came to us. In the, in the Lord, if you all remember, I'm, I know I'm not going to get to it today now, but <clears throat> the Lord said some things to us along the way that I'm going to remind us of. It's part of this word. But one of the things the Lord said to me that I said to you all is this. The Lord does not just want to heal you so you can feel better. The Lord wants to heal you so you can do better. It's not that he doesn't care about how we feel and our heart and our peace and our well. He does. He loves us. He's a good father. But what good is the healing of the Lord if he heals us and we never get back on the course of productivity in our life call. Then the adversary has actually accomplished what he was trying to accomplish. Even though you feel better, if you don't get back on that horse, come on, y'all. If, if you don't take the steps that God orders of therapy, then the injured part will keep you from walking, come on, out the course of the, your life and your purpose and your destiny. And I'm not going to re-share my testimony today, but you know I've shared with you before, when I had my first knee injury and I was in that hip cast for seven weeks, they cut that cast off, excuse me, six weeks, they cut that cast off, <clears throat> And my thigh was about as big around as my wrist. I looked like I had rickets. Nobody knows what rickets are anymore. <laughs> I looked I, like I was malnutritioned. Um, and all kinds of scar tissue formed at the place of the injury. Now, I was healed. All the healing was done. But I had no more strength in my leg because I hadn't used it in six weeks. All my muscle had atrophied. And my leg had been in this position so long that they, uh, medical doctors call them adhesions. Oh, my God, that's so prophetic. These adhesions formed. And it's a tissue that's not healthy tissue that forms in the place of the injury. And it's not as uh, elastic, it's not as flexible, as real, health, as real tissue. And so it actually limits your movement. And so uh, they, they do it different now. Nowadays when you have surgery, they don't put you in a cast for six weeks. They 
get you up and they get you moving right away. Why? Because they've learned that those adhesions, that scar tissue will form at greater levels if you just sit there. And so, I guess I'm already telling the story. <clears throat> and so, I went to this therapy guy, and he was a physical therapist, and he was supposed to help me get the strength back in my leg and all those kind of things. <clears throat> and one of the things that we had to do was get my leg to straighten out again because it had been like this for six weeks. And even though I wanted to straighten it out, those adhesions were uh, in there and they wouldn't let it straighten out. The scars limited my mobility. And do you know that this big therapy guy, big weightlifter guy, we'd sit on the floor, my leg would be, you know, like bent, like a teepee, and he'd say, okay, I'm going to flatten your leg out now, and he'd start to flatten my leg out, and my knee would start to hurt. And I thought, I'm still injured. He said, no, you're not injured, you've healed. Those are the scar tissue, and we've got to tear the scar tissue loose. And because it hurt, he'd push on my leg and I'd, I'd tighten my little skinny thigh up with all the strength I had. He'd say, you got to relax. I'd say, I can't. You got to quit. This is so prophetic. You got to quit pushing against me. I can't. I want to. I, but every time you push, it hurts and I tighten up. <clears throat> so here's what we did. He bought, <clears throat> he bought a big plastic garbage can and he filled it full of ice water. And I mean ice water. I'd come in and I'd step in over that garbage can and that garbage can, that water would come up right to the top of my thigh and it wasn't just cold. After a while, it hurt. If you've ever been so cold like it hurts... And then, so you, you're like, ah. And then after, oh, I don't remember how long, but after a while, you don't feel it anymore. Because that, that cold has penetrated so far in that you're numb. And then he'd take my leg out of there, bent leg on the floor. Actually, he'd put me between two chairs. And he'd say, now let's break that loose. And now he'd push down on my leg and I wouldn't feel the, I wouldn't feel the adhesions ripping loose. And the Holy Spirit does that in our life. The Holy Spirit comes like an anesthetic so that when he wants to deal with all that pain and that injury in our life, we can relax and let him, and let him break that scar tissue loose. Amen? So we get our mobility back. And then after that, then I had to do the hard work of exercise and weight lifting and all those kind of things and running and walking. Or even though I'd had surgery and my leg was healed, I'd have never been able to resume the natural course of my life. And so when injury happens in our life or when we make dumb mistakes, that's what God's doing. He's trying to work in a way that that, that stuff, though it may have been traumatic at the moment, he heals us. He rehabilitates us. He, he gives us therapy. He says, begin to follow me again. He gets us back on the course of our life. Amen? Amen. And so how is it that God gets you to the bullseye? If there's a bullseye, if there's a destiny he has for you, and, you're, and we're walking out every day of our life, right? As according to the scripture, feeling after God, how does he order the steps of our life? With his word. With his, not just general word, but with his rhema word, with his specific word. Beloved, do you know what prophetic words are? When God operates through men and women, 
uh, uh, who are prophetically gifted and they say, this is what I see for you or I hear God saying such and such a thing for you or whatever. You know what those are? Those are words that frame for us the bullseye. Or those are words that help us with a mid-course correction. Because something's happened in our life and we're not quite on course. And so the Lord speaks a word to align us so that we're back on the path. And so his word becomes a lamp to our feet and light to our path. But again, light and lamp, prophetic word, because the end is already defined. Are you, I'm trying to get you to see that. So the word he's bringing is so you know what he knows about your life. So that you see what he sees about your life. So that you can get a glimpse of page 90 when you're only on page 45. So you can get a glimpse of chapter 30 when you're walking in chapter 15. That's good. That's God's good. See, that's why all through the, what we call the Old Testament, that's why God raised up prophets to point the way towards something. And he'd continually come through different prophets one way or another and either remind him, excuse me, remind them of something he'd already said. He might have said it in a slightly different way, but reaffirming what the prophet already said. Or if Israel was a mess, which they often were, then he'd call the prophet and the prophet would come and say, you bucket heads. I know your Bible may not say that, but in essence, that's what he was saying. God would come and, rem- and, and tell them what they were doing that was keeping them from being on the course that he'd laid out for them. And that's why before reformation, renewal, and revival occur, most often in the church and in our lives, that's why most often it always starts with repent. Right? Think about this for a minute. You're walking down the course of your life And then something distracts you, whatever that is. And so you leave the course of your life and you go over to this distraction. You follow this distraction, whatever that is. Whatever the sin is, you follow the distraction. And you get over here and you're living in this sin, whatever it is. And then the Lord comes to you somehow, one way or another, and he says, hey, buckethead, stop that. This isn't for you. It's not right. It's whatever he says to you. And he says, repent. What does that mean? Turn around and go the right way. And so you know what you do? You go back to where you left the path and you get back on course. And that's what the word of the Lord does for us. Hallelujah. 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 Not only is his Logos word general, and again, I'm not trying to make this sound like it's not important, but it's, it's general wisdom. It, it's always good. You can always use it. There's nothing in there that we shouldn't honor and, and own, own it, apprehend it, comprehend it. But what I'm trying to say is 
that the rhema word of the Lord is more than that. The rhema word of the Lord is when the Holy Spirit goes to that logos word and says, that scripture is for you right now. Right now. Pay attention to this. What I want to say to you today is, what I want you to focus on right now in this season is to address the course of your life to keep you on course. Which is why one person could be hearing from God and he's lighting on a specific area of their life and in a specific book or scripture and the person right next to you, God is highlighting something else in their life with a different scripture or a different book because he's trying to get each of us or each of you keep us on course and heading toward the bullseye. Amen? I think what I'm going to end up doing today is laying the foundation and I'm about done and be more specific next time we're together. So Psalm 25, 1 says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Now that's interesting. Let's be purposeful here and not just read that scripture generically. Because remember, God's made us in his image as triune beings, which mean that we have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit, right? So the Holy Spirit lives in our spirit, and the body is pretty easy to identify. It's the soul that we usually kind of interchange in our conversations with spirit, When we say spirit and soul, sometimes we mean the other thing. But the soul, really, in simple form, is the self. It's the you. It's the me. It's the us. And in simple explanation, what makes your soul? Your mind, your intellect, your emotions or your feelings, and your volition or your will. That's kind of the soul, the self. So when we're tripping, what's tripping? Your body? Not necessarily. I mean, your spirit? No. What's tripping? Your soul. Your, mo- your mind. Something's going on in your mind, right? Your mind's wandering. Your mind's running. You're irrational. Whatever's going on, your mind's tripping. Or your feelings. Sometimes our emotions get blown way out of proportion. And our feelings want to lead us, right? How many of you have followed your feelings? Yep, we all have. Back in the 60s, they had a saying, if it feels good, do it. That's what that, that's, that's demonic, We don't think of it as, but it is. And so, in other words, the psalmist is actually talking about his soul. So something's going on. He says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Now look, he says, if you're reading with me, can somebody say what it says with me? Show me your ways. O Lord, Teach me your paths. Lead me, teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Lord, show me your ways. Say, show me your ways. ways. Teach me your paths. Show me your ways. Repeat after me again. Show me your ways. Teach me your paths. Do you understand that the way that the Lord shows us his paths is by us knowing his ways. Show me your ways so I'll understand your path. So 
The Lord does that by his word, but we have to understand his ways. Are you with me? How does God do a thing? What does God do? How does he do it? Isaiah 64, 5 says, You meet him who rejoices and does righteousness, who remembers you in your ways. Psalm 37, 34 says, Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. Listen. Inherit the land, that's a promise word. That's a destiny word. That's a bullseye word. That's a he has something specifically for you word. And how is it that we inherit the land according to this? We keep his way. To keep his way, you got to know his ways. Are you with me? And in Psalm 95, 9, uh, it's recounting the children of Israel's journey when they were in the wilderness after he'd taken them out of Egypt. And it's actually God talking in the psalm. And he says, for 40 years, I was grieved with that generation and said, this is God speaking, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So the astray means you're off course. You missed the path, right? And so where does that happen? In the heart. God says they went astray in their heart because they did not know my ways. And earlier in Psalm 119, the psalmist says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you or miss the mark or miss the way. Are you with me? So this is where I want to close us today. Since God leads us or orders our steps by his word, not just general word, but specific word, rhema word, the word that's for you, the word that helps order your steps, we have to understand the way that God does that. God speaks a word. Hey, Brother Norman, I'm going to need you to show something up on the slide here in just a second. So the way God does that is God speaks his word. The problem is that this is the way that we think God speaks his word. I want you to show the one that says um, ordered steps linear. Should be the first one. How many of you know the scripture in Isaiah 28? God says, for precept must be upon precept and line, what's it say? Read with me. And line upon line. It does not say, beloved, line after line. It says line Upon line. And here's the problem. We often live in such a way that we relegate the word of God linearly. Why do we relegate the word of God linearly? When I say linearly, what do I mean? I mean in a consecutive line. For example, if I'm walking... I take one step, I take the next step, I take the next step, that is linear. I'm going in a straight line, one step follows the next step. 
And you might think, well, wait a minute. You just spent the whole morning talking about the way God orders our steps and our path with his word. What are you saying? What I'm saying is that what we want to do when God gives us a word or God gives us direction or God gives us light is because we live linearly, because we live in time, what we want to do is we want our lives to be such so that one thing is nice and neat and follows after the other. So what we want God to do is to say such and such. And then we want all the time that we want to walk in that word or figure out that word, and we do not want God to do or say another thing until we've finished linearly with the process. Then we say, okay, God, I'm ready for the next thing now. Give me a break, Lord. Give me a space of time. Whatever you say to me, let me walk in this. Let me pause, catch my breath. And then now you can speak the next word. And I'll determine when I want you to speak the word after that. And when I want you to speak the word after that. Which means that really, in that kind of process, who's determining the timing? We are. Because we're really determining how quickly we, as it were, embrace the word, walk in the word, or how that word becomes flesh, right? Because that's the goal. The goal is for his word to become flesh. For him to speak it, for us to become conformed or transformed into his image. But that scripture does not say line after line, does it? It says, Brother Norman, would you show the next slide? It says line upon line. And so, beloved, this is actually how God works. Why am I showing you this? Because the scripture just says, we will go astray if we don't know his ways. And his ways are not linear. His ways are not line after line. His ways are line upon line. And so the way God works, according to Isaiah 58, what God's trying to do in your life, and in my life, and what God is doing in the uh, life of this corporate congregation, and really each and every corporate congregation, is God is trying, working, he's purposing through his rhema word, say rhema word, to raise up the foundations of each generation. And so what God does is God will give you a word. God will give you light. God will say something to you. And you will start to walk in that word. And then guess what God does? God will say something else. More revelation. Different revelation, a different thing, a new thing, an additional thing. Here's the problem, beloved. God expects you and expects me to continue to walk out and walk in this word even though he's just added another one. In other words, I can't drop or stop allowing God to transform me with this word just because he speaks another word. If we did that, imagine how long the process 
of transformation would take if everything was linear. And so that's not God's way. God's way is he will say something to you and while you're walking in it, based on his timing, he will add something else to you and fully expect that you don't drop, stop, or de-emphasize the first thing he said to you while you start to walk in the last, excuse me, the, the new thing he said to you. If God starts talking to you about holiness and starts getting your attention about holiness, and let's say he starts talking about um, lying. And so God starts talking to you basically saying, lying is not supposed to be among you. Repent, stop lying. And then the next thing God says is stop stealing. And you go, stop stealing, stop lying. Does that mean it's okay to start lying again because you're emphasizing stop stealing? Well, of course not. Or he says, stop, stop fornicating. When God does those things, he's adding each one of them, expecting us to walk in the first one, bring the next one alongside, walk in the second one, bring the next one alongside, walk in the next one. Are you with me? And so in doing that, God actually not only uh, starts to set foundation in your life, but God actually is able to raise the foundations in your life. Because now it's not a linear process. Now what God does is he starts to build. He lays the first thing, and while you're walking in the first thing, God lays another. Not when you're done with the first thing, but as you're walking out the first thing. And then God adds on top of that another. And so as God does that in your life, he's raising, heightening, advancing the standard in your life. Because two things happen. Not only do you go to a, as it were, higher level, in your relationship with Christ, but you're also, because you're walking in the first word, or you're walking out the first word, not only are you going higher, but you're going farther. Are you with me? Because look what happens. God starts adding a word in your life, he adds another one, you go higher, but because you were walking in this one, you go further. You keep walking in both of these, God adds another one, you go higher, but you not only go higher, you go further, because now you're walking in those words. Are you with me? And so that's the way God orders the steps of our life. God gives you a word, he emphasizes a scripture, somebody gives you a prophetic word, he gives you a glimpse, because at the end of this process, And obviously this graphic doesn't do it justice. But at the end of this process, way up there and way out there, guess what? We are Christ-like and we hit the bullseye. We hit the mark. But what I'm trying to say is that's not just general knowledge. That's not just read the Bible. That is specific rhema words that God is using to lay in your life to get you to be the person that he sees you to be so that you can fulfill your purpose. All of that is so you become Christ-like and can hit the target, hit the bullseye, hit your purpose. Are you with me? So as I close this morning, well, it's actually afternoon, what I'd like you to do is during this week, would you rethink, as I encouraged you to do a few weeks ago, would you rethink, go back, take the time to pause, and go back and think about some of the specific ways God's ordered your step with revelation and word over the course of your life. 
Think back over those things. Not When I say revelation, I don't mean that you understand a, the, a theological principle better. I mean that you look where God spoke to you about something that had to do with you with a particular scripture or God healed you of a certain thing or God ordered your steps in your, uh, a certain way or God showed you something about you or your family or whatever. Um, go back and look at some of those things in your life. See, for example, some of those things are where God gives understanding of some of his ways. Remember, it has to do with his ways in our life. Sister Linda's father was in the military. And so she traveled all over, not just the United States, but all over the world growing up. She was in Germany and where else, sis? Italy, England, France, Austria, living on those military bases because that's where her, she traveled with her father. And then multiple places in the United States. Linda, of all those places that, that you lived, how many of those places, those bases, the, uh, the people that God um, immersed you in while you were uh, stationed living your life with your father, how many of those places were primarily African American? Say that louder, please. How many? None? They were what? Primarily what? Primarily Caucasian. And now, today, part of your heart is to be in a multi-ethnic congregation. Don't you have some insight now as an African American about what it's like to live among Caucasians? Probably insight that some other African Americans do not have who did not have your experience growing up primarily surrounded by Caucasians. God was ordering your steps. That's one of the ways God, that's one of God's ways in your life, making you into the person you are today and preparing you for part of how you live out your life and part of what you're called to do. That means you have an anointing you have an ability, you have insight, you have wisdom from those experiences in your life that some people don't have. God ordered your steps. And if that's an example where our, if you'll take the time to think about some of the things that occurred in your life, and you might not even see that um, as the word of God, but nonetheless, you were born into the family you were born in. Was that by accident? It wasn't by accident. Now, we all have dysfunctional families, and not every family is, right? On, but the, po the point is we're not born into a family on accident. Sister, you're African-American. That's not on accident. You're also a female. That's not on accident. God purposely made you a woman and a black woman. That's not an accident. That's so that you can fulfill who he's called you to be on the earth. I'm a male and I'm a white male. That's not an accident. God did that on purpose. I could not fulfill my purpose in the earth as a black female. Are, are you with me? Because I'm not a black female. God does those things on purpose. And if we'll take the time to look at the dots in our life and look at some of those significant life events and look at some of the quote-unquote circumstances around our life. And I want to say this to you and then I'm going to finish. Including the things in your life that you would say are negative. Not just the good stuff, but look at all the stuff. 
Some of the stuff that you did that were mistakes shaped you into the person you are today. Some of that might have been shaping what you would say is for good. Some of that might have shaped you in a way that you would say is not so good. Some stuff happened to you outside of your control that you would say has affected you in a way that's not good. Some of it you've overcome and you can say it, it's worked toward my good. But my point is that since God has had you on a course for your life and he knows everything that is going to happen to you and has happened to you, we can't discount the things in our life and toss them aside without letting God speak to us about what those things mean or what they meant or how he wanted to use them. Are you with me? There, beloved, when we have painful pasts, we don't want the past in our present. So we want to put this barrier up of the past. I'm saying God is trying to reconcile our past because it's part of our history. But we've got to get God's perspective on our history or not only will we not understand God's place in our history, but, but, but we won't be positioning ourselves in a way where all these things can work together for our good. Are you with me? So we can't ignore our past. We can't ignore our history. We can certainly say, that wasn't a good thing, but now I'm going to look at that thing that wasn't good and say, how is it affecting me today? Have I let God cause it? To work together for my good. Because beloved, many of the things that either we stumbled in ourselves or that we were put upon and injured in by others where we've now overcome those things, overcome the sin in us that caused us to do X, Y, or Z or overcome the damage in us that somebody else perpetrated is a place of great anointing because the power of God rests right there. And that is part of purpose and that is part of how God raises up his presence in the foundation of your life. Amen? Amen. Say, I'm not a victim. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. I'm not a victim. I'm a victor. I'm not damaged goods. I'm not, a, I'm not broken. And if there's a place of injury in my life that's still present, it is going to be a place of strength. Did you all know that when you break a bone in your body, like a fracture, do you know that when they set that bone, that the place of the break is actually stronger than the rest of the bone. Yes. Amen. Now here's the important thing. We got to make sure that those places in our life that were places of brokenness got set correctly. Are you hear me? I don't know if you've ever heard stories, but I've heard stories where people have like broken something and then either they didn't go to a doctor or they did go to a doctor and something happened and it didn't get set correctly and the bone was out of alignment and then it started to grow back that way and then 
you've started to get stronger now out of alignment. And guess what the doctor has to do? He's got to go back and break it again to reset it properly. So, beloved, these areas of injury and hurt and brokenness in our life, we have got to make sure that they were set properly because they're going to be, it's going to be real strong right there. If you've been injured and hurt in some place, you get some, you get some conviction in you, don't you, around that thing. You, 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 recognize, um, you recognize force like what injured you before, and you resist it with more strength, don't you? Aren't you able to resist a certain kind of injury stronger after the injury than before the injury? You are. We just got to make sure that we're straight. With me? We got to make sure we let God line that up. We got to make sure that we don't start making some judgments or some decisions or develop some views, some mindsets or some attitudes that are unhealthy or negative because of that. Let me give you an example and I really am going to stop. God is emphasizing in this season, he's making it real clear again that this country and the body of Christ still has real racial issues between white folks and black folks. That's not new, beloved. That's not new. But it's come back to the surface and very visible again. And guess what? You got black folks who have been hurt by white folks for generations. And the wound and the break that was created because of the injury from racism and oppression in many black folks has not healed correctly. And vice versa. You got white folks who are fearful or, or have been hurt by black folks and the, and the injury's not healed right. And so, so guess what's present? Because of the injury, prejudice is present. Now I've let that thing heal incorrectly and now I view all black folks. Come on, y'all. I view all black folks wrongly because of that injury. Or black folks view all white folks wrongly because of that injury. Are you with me? That's an example where we got to make sure we let God heal and set the thing right. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Some women have been mistreated by men. May have been married more than one time. And guess what? They don't trust men no more. As a matter of fact, I don't need no man. How about that? That is an example where something has been set wrong and is not healed correctly. Are you with me? That's what I'm talking about. That's where this becomes real life to us. We got to look for those kind of things in our lives and go, wait a minute, that something's not right there. I understand the injury. I understand the break. But now it, I may be past the break, past the injury, but has it been set right? Because it got set in, but is it set right? Because if it's not set right, we will walk with a limp. In following God, something's going to be out of a line and we're not going to be able to pursue or follow the way of God, the will of God, the light of God, from the word of God, the way he, the way he wants us to. He'll say, do such and such a thing, and we'll say, uh-uh. I ain't doing that. Are you with me?